Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. Welcome to Digital Domination Super Summit. This is where some of the smartest minds in tech share lessons and actionable tips to improve your business. I'm taking notes along the way. I'm the founder of InspiredInsider.com where I talk with successful entrepreneurs and leaders. Everyone who's live, put your name in there. Feel free to ask questions throughout and also we'll take questions at the end. And I just want to introduce today's special guest. We have Nick Francis. He's the co-founder and CEO at Help Scout, which is a simple way to provide excellent customer support. He's going to talk about some of the lessons learned, what worked, what didn't work. Last month, their company helped process over 4 million emails. Nick, is that right? I got that from the website today. Uh, yeah, I think it's over five now. <laughs> oh, okay. Of five million last month. Their customers include companies like Buffer, Kissmetric, Shutterfly, and many more. Nick, thank you so much for taking the time today. My pleasure to be with you, Jeremy. I'm excited. And what I want to ask, I know you have a great presentation, some great things to share with us. I want to know first, what inspired the inception of Help Scout? Sure. So Help Scout, we founded it a little over three years ago. And uh, we were running, a, my co-founders and I have two co-founders, Denny and Jared, and we were running a consulting company. Uh, so Help Scout was born out of a consulting company, not unlike many other startups that have gone on to bigger and better things. But uh, we did a lot of work in online retail. Uh, we had an app of our own that we had actually built and were trying to grow enough so that we could do less consulting work. And over the course of that period, we found a need to really just be able to share an inbox for support, to support our own application. We had a lot of customers in online retail that had kind of that same pain point. They wanted kind of the scale of a help desk, but they still wanted the personal touch of uh, what you get from email. And so that's kind of what we started with. Thankfully, we were able to kind of dog food the process, use our own product from day one. And that really helped us kind of get to a, to a first version, get some customers, and as they say, the rest is history. Yeah. So we'll hear a little bit about that journey with the lessons. I'll let you right now take over the the screen so you can okay. uh, pull up your um, uh, your presentation and and then I'll let you take it from there. I'll interject with different questions throughout and okay. uh, also with the people's questions in the live chat. So feel free to ask. Okay. So just confirming. Are you able to see the? the You're key? good. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I just wanted, this is kind of an informal presentation. I just wanted to go over some of the lessons we've learned at Help Scout in kind of three years of running a successful software as a service business. My hope is that you take at least a couple of things with you as a result. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started. Again, I'm the co-founder and CEO of Help Scout. We've talked a little bit about what Help Scout does. It's essentially a help desk, which means it's a great way for teams to manage their company's customer support. We primarily focus on email support, but also have a knowledge-based product called Docs. We launched the product in April 2011, have a current team of nine and 10,000 active users on a regular basis. Uh, as Jeremy said, that we're processing about 5 million emails on a monthly basis. And initially, we went through the Techstars Accelerator program, and that's why I'm here in Boston today. The company's based in Boston. We raised 800,000 through that process, and uh, we're actually profitable today, not planning to raise any further money. So, uh, that's Congratulations. That's great. Yeah, thank you. That's also something I tend to talk a lot about, uh, and I'm happy to answer any questions about kind of the fundraising process and our, our approach to growing the business uh, with our own cash rather than raising more money. But let's move on. This is a little bit of what Help Scout looks like. Essentially, it looks like an email inbox. We've just added some collaborative features right on top of it to hopefully make it easy for a team of anywhere from five people to 105 people to share an inbox and kind of stay in sync. And this is a look at the growth that we've seen in the company over the last 12 months. We now have over 1,200 paying companies, so we've seen almost 400% growth uh, in that time span. And something that I'm really proud of, in addition to our ability to acquire new customers, is our ability to keep them. So over the course of that time, we've had pretty amazing churn rate on a monthly average. It's just less than 2%. And you may be asking yourself, uh, you know, there's a lot of help desks. Help desk is a very crowded market. There's a lot of companies that want to help your company with customer support. So how the heck did a company like Help Scout 
sort of stand out from the rest in terms of growth and be able to uh, acquire all, all, the, all the, this business, make all this progress. In addition, you know, if you take a look at the, the help desk market, our competitors have more money, more product traction, uh, more people, and more customers. So, you know, we, we knew from the very beginning that we were going to have to use a very different playbook. And that's kind of what I, I want like to talk about today. There. I like your distinction there, Nick, because most people are in the same situation. You know, they feel whatever market they're in is competitive, there's bigger players in it. How do yeah. you gain market share? So I'm excited to hear, hear what you did in this funnel. Yeah, and I think that's a critical thing. I mean, everybody's out there. I hear a lot from founders that um, are trying to, to build businesses in a unique space. Uh, they're trying to solve a problem that hasn't been solved yet, and I've got news for you. Most of the problems have been solved. <laughs> uh, to me, it's all about execution at this stage. So uh, if you have an idea for a product and somebody else out there is, is in the market, that just validates that that problem needs solving and you can go about executing that in a different way. So while Help Desk is a crowded market, that doesn't mean there's not plenty of opportunity for us to go out after something. But at least for Help Desk, I felt like we needed to use a different playbook because there's some companies out there that have been extremely successful using uh, another playbook. So. Today I just want to talk about that, uh, and I call the playbook Long Ball. You'll come to realize why I call it Long Ball. Uh, but basically it applies to the entire funnel. So if you kind of break it down into three stages, the marketing stage, uh, for us, Long Ball means investing in great content marketing. In the conversion phase, it means investing in great product experience, execution over features, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. And then the third phase is all about support and creating a culture and a brand that customers trust rather than trying to lock them in uh, and keep them from leaving. So a very different playbook and the reason it's worked for us is, is three reasons primarily. The first is that long ball can't be bought. You know, you can have really deep pockets but still that's not going to help you make any progress with this particular approach. The second thing is that most people don't have the patience for it. Uh, the reason I call it long ball is because sometimes you're investing in something for six plus months before you really see that strategy take hold and start paying off for your business. And we'll talk about some specific examples. And the third thing is that it's impossible to copy. You know, once we've done a lot of things over the last three years that you can try to copy, but there's something unique to the audience that we've built for ourselves and the kind of content that we create for the brand that's very that's nearly impossible to copy. And for these reasons, it may not be a fit for you. I'll be the first to say that these things work extremely well for Help Scout and have helped us predictably grow the business at a really high rate. But at the same time, some most companies and most founders just don't have the patience for some of these strategies. So I'll leave it up to you in terms of making that decision, but I just wanted to share some of the successes and wins that we've been able to have over the last few years. So what was thing, one thing about that, the patience thing, because I think we're all impatient and we need to have more patience, sure. um, but what was one thing you remember that you knew early on was going to work and it was just one thing that you had to wait it out and keep doing and keep doing it and, and what you saw at the end of the tunnel? What was one of those examples? So a really common example is content marketing, so building an audience with your blog you know, you hear and read about a lot of companies that have used content marketing to build a great business successfully. I mean, Kissmetrics is one of the big successes, but what you don't often hear is that it takes a really long time to try and build an audience there. Sometimes it involves doing guest posts and kind of building a personal brand and trying to feed that into to what you're building as a business, but it took at least six to eight months for us to actually see predictable traction in terms of the blog. So our, we actually had a newsletter that was growing. We had uh, more and more people hitting some of our more popular posts and we were able to kind of snowball some of that growth. But it took six to eight months to get there. Does that make sense? Yeah, so what was what would you find has been your most popular or one of the most popular posts and how did you decide to create that? Because some people out there may be thinking, well, you know, I have a lot of stuff I could talk about, but what's gonna kind of resonate with people? 
Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, so we do a lot of experimentation in terms of SEO, and we even experiment with our pay-per-click marketing in order to figure out what terms people are searching for in the help desk space, and then what terms do they actually click on and what terms do they end up converting with. And then we kind of take it from there in terms of the content marketing strategy that we want to create. And so, you know, one, it's really hard to predict one that goes really well for you, but we can predict where we think we're going to rank SEO-wise for some of these interesting terms. So one that we rank really well for is called Customer Service Skills. Um, and it's an article that we wrote basically on training new employees and bringing them up in a customer service, service organization. And that one post delivers over 30,000 uniques on a monthly basis. That's wild. That's amazing. Yeah, and it's, uh, the great thing about SEO and, and content like this is that it just it takes on a life of its own and it keeps giving month and mo month after month, right? It's not one of those things where we're actually paying for those 30K uniques. We, we created the post one time and put a lot of time and energy into crafting something that was really great there. But then once it's kind of published and, and out there and it ranks really well for a certain set of keywords, then it takes on a life of its own and it's really great. I would never guess that keyword would bring in that much traffic, ever. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's one of our little secrets. <laughs> Not anymore, I guess. <laughs> okay, so let's move on to, to some marketing and the way that we use this approach to our advantage. So one thing about the marketing status quo is that typically for a software as a service business, it's very expensive. It involves investing in display ads, pay-per-click, and even when you're investing in content, if you're going through the motions, it can be very costly. Uh, but one nice thing about it is that you can easily, and you know, one thing that the big VC funded companies really like about it is that you can invest one dollar and it's very easy to measure success all the way through uh, and see that dollar turn into maybe three dollars six to twelve months down the line. But the problem is you're always recouping your acquisition costs. If you spend a hundred dollars to acquire a customer and you only get ten dollars a month from them, it's going to take ten months to get your money back, much less make any money. So you're always behind. In terms of how we build things at Help Scout, we recoup our acquisition costs in the first month because of the playbook that we've run. So we don't actually need millions of dollars to build a predictable acquisition model. And the way that we've gone about that, instead of loading tons of money into advertising and outbound marketing, we've decided to dedicate a lot of our time to just understanding the customer deeply. So our particular personas, you know, who are they? What do they read on a daily basis? How can we create and add value to their job and the company that they're trying to build on a regular basis? So really we want to understand the customer and then continue to add value, add value, add value in any way possible over the course of a long period of time because we think even if they don't end up being a Help Scout customer, Help Scout's going to be top of mind when they decide to maybe recommend it to a friend or somebody that is in looking for a help desk. That makes yeah. sense? Yeah, this is one of my favorite things that you talk about, and I'm not going to steal your thunder by jumping ahead, but um, <laughs> it's so important what you just said is knowing the customer and um, just this this personas, I'm going to let you talk about it, but it's so powerful. Sure. Okay, cool. Thank you. So the next slide here just shows a little bit of our traction in terms of traffic to the website and, and how we've been able to grow, grow our newsletter. So this is a look at, at, at the growth that we've seen. We basically went from 21,000 unique visitors just this last January to over, you know, this January we'll have well over 150,000 unique visitors to the blog. That's great. In addition, our newsletter grew by over 400%, right? So still with all this growth, what I'm most proud of is the fact that it only costs us $40 to acquire a customer, which is recouped easily in our business in the first month. So we're actually, we're never really behind the curve and that's what it allows us to grow predictably uh, but use this playbook to kind of not have to do it and, and raise a lot of money so we can stay profitable. And let me just show you a little bit uh, of what Jeremy was, was referring to. So this is one of our marketing personas. Her name is Help Desk Heidi. And this is a quote that we made up for Heidi. Generally she's unhappy with her help desk but she hasn't really found the perfect fit for their needs. We've done a lot of research on, on who this person is uh, and essentially she wants to be a great manager. She wants to provide efficient, reliable service to her customers and she also wants to further the business in some special way and make the boss happy. So she's definitely invested in, in a number of ways in the business and so now that we understand 
her pretty deeply and what she looks like and what interests her, our goal is to go out and create content that really appeals to Heidi. So the first example would be this article that we wrote that's all about building, motivating, and managing an exceptional team, right? So this is a screenshot from our newsletter. And what do you know? We get a tweet from quote unquote Heidi that says she's loving the blog post, totally helping her out, training the new clueless customer service reps. Totally makes sense and we, we feel like that piece of content really resonated with Heidi. So that's adding value that we think is, is very important to the business. Another piece, we, saw, we talked a lot about how to build a truly customer-centric company. And again, a lot of, we heard from a lot of different Heidi's and different organizations saying they could read this content all day. It's really helping them try and further the business in their own way. The third let me ask you I this, have, Nick, real quick. Yeah. Let me, let me uh, ask a question about this because a lot of work went into Help Desk Hype. <clears throat> creating help desk Heidi. Can you sure. tell us one thing or one conversation that you remember that, oh yeah, you talk to someone or do you intentionally go out and call customers? How do you get to that help desk Heidi? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, we spend a lot of time on the personas and essentially it, come, it comes down to just really getting to know your customers. So we have, uh, we've got three personas as of today and it really comes down to talking with them as much as possible. So you're going to hear from them in, in your support inbox, but it also takes some proactive outreach, getting to know somebody when, you know, I used to do a lot of uh, demos early on and I would get to know some of these companies and you just get a feel for the kind of role that they play in the business, um, who's going to be making the buying decision, and then uh, what they're looking for in a product, you know, what their needs are, what their priorities are, and from that you can sort of start to piece together some personas. So Heidi's just one of three that we've been able to put together and essentially we even have keywords that go along with these personas. So we know exactly what kind of things they're searching for and uh, so that kind of sets the stage for, you know, creating the content is pretty easy after you really narrow down what that customer looks like, if that makes sense. Yeah, I just wanted to highlight that because a lot of work went into that. It's not like you just threw up, oh, it's helped us, Heidi, but you, you know, you probably wrote down the questions they were asking, you saw the type of person and, um, you know, kind of how you were inter interacting with them and came to these personas and that allows the rest of the stuff to, to become much easier with content and everything else. Yeah, and this is a classic reason why we think customer service and customer support is a marketing opportunity. It's not really a cost in terms of the business. It's mm -hmm. actually more of a marketing expense because in terms of supporting your customers, these are opportunities to learn these are opportunities to learn more about them, what they want from your product and what they need in terms of their business and their job. So yeah. personas are something that we really make uh, we're, we're pretty religious about inside of Help Scout and we make a lot of decisions based on what we've learned from them. So the third thing that we created is this really amazing ebook. I definitely encourage you to check it out. It's probably my favorite one that just has 10 really cool stories of unforgettable customer service. So not only did we create this for Heidi, but we were hoping this would be something she could share with her team because it's got some really powerful stories in it. And uh, we were able to see this tweet. So talking about how the ebook actually brought tears to their eyes. I, I'd say that was a success. Uh, it went pretty well. So all of this starts to pile up over time and you really start to, uh, you, you add a lot of value to these people's day-to-day -day job and you see situations like this. This is one of my favorite. Uh, my friend Chris Hexton, uh, we've gotten to know him for a while. He, he's got a company called Vero. He actually wrote a blog post and said, it took me 244 days to choose a plan with Help Scout. And this screenshot here is actually a look at his inbox when he did a, a, a search for us uh, for Help Scout, and you can see every single week we're sending him an email trying to create value for him and his business through a piece of content. This is not selling, it's not ever selling, it's all about content that's trying to create something of value for him and his business. And we're fine with that, but this is what I mean by long ball. 244 days, and that's not really something that we get to measure a lot. It's great that he blogged about it, but that's the only way that we know it took almost a year for this particular company to convert to Help Scout. We're willing to put in the time and wait as long as we're adding value to what Chris and his team are doing. We know that they're going to come around and they're probably going to recommend Help Scout along the way. Yeah. I mean, and also, you know, it's about systems too. You put systems in place so all that can happen seamlessly um, with, with Chris. 
That's correct. Yeah, so we didn't even know all this was happening behind the scenes until he wrote the blog post, so that was really cool. So let's talk a little, so we, I've kind of covered some examples of how we use the long ball playbook in terms of marketing. Let's move into conversion, which is really the middle part of the funnel. And when I talk about conversion, it's more about the moment somebody signs up for a trial, that starts the conversion process. That, that's the beginning, not the end. And that's important for, for anybody to know that's running a software as a service business. When you start that trial, that's really the beginning of the conversion process. And when you look at conversion, the status quo approach is, to business is to grow at any expense. You have people on the phone selling, you tweak every detail on the site to what converts best, and add all the features that will make them buy. But instead, the long ball playbook says that we ask the customer, you know, how would you like to be treated during this process? Rather than selling, we simply try to understand their business. We optimize for conversion, not by A-B testing, silly buttons or copy, but by eliminating anything that's confusing about the onboarding process. So we'd also prefer to build fewer features, but build them in a way that's exactly what the customer would want from the product. And I want to cover a couple examples here. So the first is A-B testing. I touched on that just briefly. And it's important to, to take a look at something like, this is a typical A-B test, right? So. Um, you know, my, my only issue with something like this is that an A-B test can only measure a short-term win. Yes, the one on the left may get more conversions than the one on the right, but SaaS is a long-term play. What if, the, what if the 10 extra conversions you're getting from the A-B test on the left are actually people that are not really qualified to use your product? Well, then those 10 extra conversions don't really make any sense because they're not going to convert to being customers. So rather than put our time into a lot of A-B testing on the front end side of things, we actually decided to optimize the onboarding process. So once they actually do decide to sign up for a trial, and we're not pushing really hard for them to do that, if they find that they've got a pain point, they want to solve it with Help Scout, and they sign up for a trial, that's where we really started to use the long ball playbook. And this is what I call focusing on the details that can't be marketed. So. This is the first email that you get as soon as you sign up for Help Scout. And we spent a lot of time figuring out what the triggers were in terms of conversion from the moment you sign up all the way until you convert. What's it, what's it mean uh, to, you know, what are the activity points over the course of that trial that are going to bring about a conversion? And so the first thing that we did was try to create a series of emails. So if you don't set up a new mailbox within 24 hours, you get this lovely email that's very focused and says, here's a great video on how you can set up your first mailbox in just a few minutes. And maybe you continue, but maybe for some reason you kind of fall off the wagon again. We send you another email, maybe a couple of days later, later depending on your activity in the product, and says, hey, here's how you can get your emails into Help Scout, because there's two critical milestones in, in terms of just getting emails into the product. So it's really important to, to help, those, help set those people up for success. And then we send another email. You know, if they haven't really gotten going in the first 15 days, sometimes, sometimes it takes longer. So we've got this really cool email that says, hey, one click and you can extend your trial for another 15 days if you'd like to keep trying Help Scout. And that gives us some really great data. But let's say that they have actually gotten onboarded and they've been very active with the product, then they would actually see a different email than this one they would see one asking them to convert. So they'd say, hey, look, your trial expires in three days. We know you've been active with the product. Now's, time, now's the time to buy. Does that make sense? So we really spent a lot more time, rather than trying to optimize for trial signs up, which really doesn't impact the business in, a, in, a, in too much of a powerful way, onboarding is actually, has actually been a much bigger impact in terms of the bottom line. And so, uh, this is one way that we try to focus on some of those details that can't be marketed. Yeah, so you want them hitting, you know what those key user activities are so that they actually are getting value and will convert. How did you figure out uh, what some of those were? It's a lot like the personas, right? It, it's just about getting to know those customers. And uh, so what we had done early on in the process is just these emails would all be sent manually by a real person in the company that's just trying to learn along the way. So I sent a lot of these emails like, hey, do you need help setting up a mailbox? Is there, you know, I would check on 
you know, back in the day when we were only getting a few trials signed up a day, it was it was easy to to manage where I could actually follow up with people throughout their trial and learn as we went. So what are kind of the pain points? Where do people get held up? You know, when can I tell that somebody doesn't really have buy-in from the team? There's all these different triggers within the trial that we were able to learn about and then create automated marketing that kind of takes care of the whole thing. So now it's completely automated. Uh, we close some really big deals and, and we don't even really have any touch points a lot of times. Yeah, I like that. So basically you did everything manual and you were going back and forth and you figured out what they wanted, what was confusing, what they needed to do. So yeah, that's that's really important to, to realize. I see so many founders getting bogged down in, in details in terms of their marketing website and trying to get people to sign up when you know, really it's all about the conversion process after they sign up. To me, that's where you're really going to impact the revenues of the businesses in terms of optimizing that process. So we started with onboarding rather than anything else. Got it. And to touch on one other piece, I mean, um, when I think about features, so many companies get carried away with being comparable in terms of features. But the truth is, most customers don't care about this stupid table at all. They only care about how the product feels and what it's like to use and the value that's added to their day-to-day -day life by using it. Very, other than the real nerds in the audience, like nobody cares about this table. They care about what phone is, is the best possible experience and, and most enjoyable to use. And so with Help Scout, we took a very different approach. It's not about being able to uh, stand side by side with any other help desk in terms of a feature comparison. It's about how we've executed the few features that we did choose to build. And I find so many companies getting carried away in terms of trying to compare to the big guys in terms of this table, when really you just need to be focusing on execution. But that's another long ball type of move, right? Sometimes you don't see that really pay off for a long time. You just have to trust uh, that you're able to create an experience that's superior. Yeah, I like that chart because it really, you know, when you see one of those things, you're looking for one or two things that really make a difference, and that that's kind of what your your company focuses on, those one or two things, instead of pulling out all these features that, you know, that it has. Right. It's always, when, when you're buying something, it's always tempting to be wowed by some of the stats, some of the things that are actually in this table, but in terms of actually using the product, those wear off within the first week. It's all about what the experience is like and not what the phone can do, right? Yeah. So what we focus on a lot more at Help Scout is the experience. We do a lot of little stupid things like, like this screen, for instance. So uh, whenever you've done something awesome in, in Help Scout, we have a tendency to say huzzah. And it started as just kind of a, a weird thing when we built the application. But we get about one of these tweets every week <laughs> I blame you for making my customer engagement managers yelling out huzzah every three minutes. It's so awesome. That's the kind of experience factor that really matters. Uh, Paul here is not really caring too much about whether we have feature X, Y, or Z. He just cares about the experience that we're bringing about by him using the product. So how did huzzah come, come to be? I just made it up one day. <laughs> I, I mean, had to fill in the, uh, the empty mailbox screen and... I just said, uh, you know, that's how, I guess that was my word at the moment for how it felt to, have, to be an inbox zero, and so we put it in there, and now it's in the application in several different spots, so it's just kind of serendipitous. Got it. So let's talk about the third part of the funnel, which is retention. Um, retention is, is where I see a lot of companies being most vulnerable. The status quo is so focused on growth and acquisition and spending money in order, in order to acquire customers that they often forget the importance of keeping the customers that they have. Past locking them into an annual contract, there isn't much being done to actually keep, keep customers, keep their trust, and continue to create a great experience for them over time. And as I mentioned earlier in my presentation about our churn, this is something that we're extremely proud of. We work really hard at trying to keep a customer once we've earned their business. And what one thing that we do is try to treat support as a marketing expense. So we spend a silly amount of time talking with customers, recording their feedback, and training them. We'll do, you know, we'll do seven or eight demos if that's what it takes. 
in order to get them trained up, and we'll do it all for free. And what's great about retention is, is that it just takes work. It doesn't actually take any spe special technical chops. It, there's no magic to it, really. You just have to treat people well and listen to what they have to say, and retention kind of happens on its own. You're going to build trust through just building a relationship with customers. And one example that we've actually tried to force this sort of uh, mentality at Help Scout is through what we call 20% time. And so basically everybody in the entire company is able to spend 20% of their time doing something that's going to, uh, that's not on the roadmap, but a customer asks for it. We feel like it's in line with what we want to do, and they can knock it out right then and there. So the, we found that at Help Scout the biggest wins come from when a customer emails about something that clearly needs to be fixed or changed, and we're able to do that within a couple of hours, with the, or even within the same day. We're just able to turn something around and make that improvement for them right there. And that's the biggest wow factor that we can have as a, as a business in terms of the customer is just beyond words when we're able to turn those kinds of things around for them. So we actually made it official and said, drop everything you're doing. If you feel like you can do something that will wow the customer, feel free to spend up to 20% of your time on a weekly basis doing those sorts of things. And as a result, we get tweets like this all the time. Possibly the most responsive but still discerning team I've come across when it comes to implementing feature requests. And one of the reasons Galen says this is only because not only do we listen, but a lot of times we're able to turn around some of his quick improvements really fast. And so that's just a win for everybody involved. Let me ask you this about the 20% time, because also as, uh, as founder, um, how do you... Do people structure it themselves? Is there like a company structure where it just choose a day a week? How do they how do they uh, structure that? I guess. So we've experimented with it because we're we're working with on a lot of uh, kind of bigger picture things too, and so uh, sometimes we'll schedule it. So every eight weeks we have a kind of what we call a fix week, which is where we just knock out. Last time we did fix week, we knocked out about uh, twenty five small little improvements to the product all in one week. So sometimes it's a scheduled thing like that. Um, sometimes, literally, we'll just get a support email and we'll kind of talk it over real quick and say, you know what, this needs to be fixed or this needs to be changed, whatever they're looking for, or, or maybe this is an improvement we can make. And we just turn it around. We drop everything and just make it happen. So there's a little bit of discussion, but you know, we're a nine-person team, so not a whole lot of uh, structure is necessary in order to just say, hey, we need to do this and just turn around and do it. Yeah, yeah, because I could see people being overwhelmed, like, whoa, we have so much to do, and now basically that's a day a week that someone can do whatever they want or work on whatever they want. Yeah, to me, it's, it's a very valuable investment because you're making the product better. That 20% time is still going to making the product better. It may yeah. just not be in terms of exactly what you had planned for the roadmap, but you're, you're making the product better, and you're making a, a customer, pretty much a customer for life. By, by that kind of wow factor. So I, I still think it's a really in incredible investment of time. Oh, yeah. I mean, I've heard uh, Google does this. I don't remember it. You probably remember it. Was it some, like, Gmail was created out of 20% time or something that we use every day? I don't remember it was, what it yeah. was. Yeah, and yeah. I've heard rumors that 20% time doesn't exist at Google anymore. But <laughs> the thing about ours is that it, it is still focused on making the core product better. It's all centered around the customer experience. So. 20% time is always dedicated to things that customers are asking for. Not really experimental projects on the side, but ways to make Help Scout better today. Got it. Okay, so let's summarize a few of the benefits uh, that we've seen, at least, from using the long ball approach. First of all, it doesn't require a lot of funding. We've already covered the way that we can actually acquire a customer and recoup our costs in the first month, and that's really through doing content marketing. The second that is, is that growth is incredibly predictable. When you've got uh, an SEO strategy that is working for you month after month, and you've got a brand that's out there, uh, you know, we still get a third of our customers through word of mouth. And all of these little sources that we get visitors and trials through is incredibly predictable over time, which is really great for everybody involved. And thirdly, you can build a company that people love. You don't have to make any compromises in terms of having salespeople dial for dollars, or really you can choose to 
treat the customer how you would want to be treated as a customer, and I can assure you that will build a brand that people grow to trust, and as long as you continue to do it the right way, then people grow to love that brand, and that's something that uh, can really build something for the long haul that's super powerful and, and not really anybody can copy. So uh, I think it's worked really well for us, and I also think it can work for you too. So thank you for tuning in, and I'd like to, to open up the rest of my time today for, for any questions that you have. And um, I'm going to go check in the questions, but where can people reach out to you and, and uh, find your, your company? Yeah, so uh, helpscout.net is our website, and helpscout.com also goes to the same spot. Uh, I'm at Nick Francis on Twitter. If you want to just hit me up with any questions, I'd be happy to, to get to you hopefully this afternoon. And uh, yeah, I'm just I'm super passionate about this stuff. I think that's this is kind of the the new way for startups to kind of grow profitably, uh, kind of bootstrap their own way, and still build something that their customers really love and something that's rewarding for the whole team. So I'm I'm happy to talk about these kinds of things. And yeah, I hope you'll reach out. Yeah, I really appreciate your time on this, Nick. And uh, as you come on from the coming out of the um, the PowerPoint, I'm gonna look at the some of the questions and um, pull these up because there was a number of questions coming throughout. Some I asked, some uh, I just held to the end. So um, I'm going to pull a few and I appreciate everyone. If anyone has questions, put them in there now so that I can make sure to ask Nick while we have him on live. Um, and I'm going to wait for him to come on up after coming in from the, the PowerPoint. But um, so Nick, uh, I'm going to ask the first question, and um, first question is from Irene, and um, also I'll be put the the lower third on so that people can see your uh, name, oh. company, all that. That's perfect. Boom. All right, huzzah, I should say. Um, let's see. So the first question, <laughs> the first question comes from Irene, and she was wondering about your opinion on hip pull and intercom and any tools that you recommend for engaging users and customers? Yeah, there's tons of really great tools out there. Intercom's a good one. Uh, we do some work with customer.io. That's another really great product for what we call lifecycle marketing emails. And so uh, there's some really great products out there. I mean, we, we do it ourselves. We send those emails ourselves because we already do email at scale. But even if you just wanted to do the email part and manage the rest internally, because those metrics are very important. So we like to measure the metrics internally, and you could use something like Mailgun or SendGrid or whatever just to send the emails for you and do that hard part. So there's lots of great alternatives available and, and different products that will kind of suit whatever your needs are. Another question someone asked was, is it possible to integrate Help Scout with a CRM? Yeah, so currently we integrate with Capsule and we integrate with HiRise. Uh, we also have this auto BCC feature, which just allows you to, uh, pretty much every CRM has a way to BCC the CRM and get all your conversations in there. So you can turn auto BCC on, and it'll virtually work with any CRM available. So we feel like we've got pretty good coverage there. OK. And um, another question is, what's one of your favorite stories uh, from the best customer support ebook? Oh, man. Um, there's some really great stories. I, I think one that sticks out to me right now is one where um, <laughs> it's from Gaylord Opryland. So it's a uh, hotel down in Nashville. That's actually my hometown. Uh, tremendously successful hotel. Anyway, someone went there. She stayed the night. And she loved this like special alarm clock that was in the room. And she uh, sent them a note and said, I've looked everywhere for this alarm clock. I'm, it has the most amazing sounds that come out of it, like, you know, that help me sleep. And I can't find it anywhere. I've looked everywhere. And uh, Opryland actually sends her a note back and says, you know, that's actually one that's just made for our hotels. It's not one that you can buy. Uh, but they actually, in the mail, they sent her <laughs> two of them. And so she could actually have one at her house. So, like, just crazy stories of uh, incredible customer service. That's just one of them. It's one of my favorites. I like that one. That's a good one. There's another question, and um, this is the last question I'll take. 
Um, if anyone has any others, let us know. But um, you know, I know culture, creating culture is really important. You know, because you always are stressing, um, you know, customer support and going above and beyond. How do you hire and train the team to create that that great culture? That's something that we're learning, but one thing that I can share is that it's critical for everyone on the team to have access to the same information that I do in terms of being the CEO. So we open up pretty much everything in terms of information so that it can flow freely, whether that's our revenues and budgets or uh, you know everybody on the team does support. So when information flows freely in a company, people go out of their way to learn about the personas and they go out of their way to they feel like they're they're part of building this with us rather than just kind of punching a time card so I think that just letting them in on everything that you can in terms of information will bring about greater investment from them in the business and then uh, there's all kinds of cool things that can come from that but I, I definitely encourage having everybody on the team do support if they talk to these personas and they're able to pick them out then it's much easier for them to to remember them as they kind of do their day-to-day -day job. Was it a tough decision to be so open? Because I could see that not being an easy thing right away. I do that pretty naturally. Uh, maybe for some people it's it's tough, but I, I think that's kind of the way that things go. I don't ever want to... We work really hard to hire people. It takes a long time. It's very expensive, so I don't ever want to lose somebody. So I would prefer to give them kind of the keys to the kingdom and let them and say to them, hey, this is yours as much as, as it is mine, let's build this together. I just think that's the right approach to kind of keep people in it for the long haul. Yeah. Nick, um, I appreciate your time. One last question is, obviously, you guys are doing awesome uh, work and growing. What's been a big challenge? I think the biggest challenges that we have this year are just building the right team. So we're going to go from what we are now, which is nine people, to 17 by the end of the year. It's pretty big. Wow. That's huge. Um, and it, just hiring the right people, that's, I think that's the one thing that could prevent us from reaching the goals that we have for the year is just making a couple of bad hires. So it's really important for us to invest 110% into finding the perfect fit in terms of skill set and culture so that we can grow this business together. I mean, otherwise, we've, we've figured out a lot of the uh, levers in the business in terms of acquisition and marketing and product. We figured a lot of that out. We just need the right people to help us execute those things at scale. What have you found that's worked with hiring? Because um, that's not easy. Even growing to nine people, that's still a, a lot. To me, it's... Um, having a few people involved in the process that you really trust. So I believe every all nine of the people that are on our team today are A players that I would trust making a hiring decision. So part of it's just having them talk to a few people. Um, another part of it's just being able to see their work. But uh, it's really just investing a lot of time into the process. You know, not, not willing to make any exceptions. I learned early on uh, that there are perfect fits out there, so hold out for them. You know, if it's a 95% there, it's probably a no. As sad as that is, uh, just don't make any exceptions. I think that, you know, we've interviewed, we've had over 300 applications for our most recent uh, hire, for our, a new support person hire, and it's hard going through all of those, but we're not going to make any exceptions. We're going to find the one that, that is the best fit for us. So what do you look for? Uh, let's see. That's a lot of that's a lot of applicants to sift through. Yeah, <laughs> and a support person. Um, you know, a lot of it's about culture, just in terms of do they is their writing style what, the way that we want it to be? Um, do I just like hanging out with them? If I do a thirty minute interview, do we really get along? Do we value the same things? I think values is very important. Um, are they going to make the same decision I'm going to make nine times out of ten? Uh, and that one time, is it something that we can have an open discussion about? You know, we don't really have time to debate things all the time. We need to have a, a strict set of values that we're just on the same page and we can move forward in lockstep. So kind of measuring for those values and making sure that you kind of value the same things in terms of business and dealing with customers, that's, that's most important to me. Yeah, no, that's valuable, and I know anyone 
you know, that's a huge step in the company just to hire anyone because they're going to be representing uh, you. It's fun, though. Meet some great people. Yeah. So, Nick, I just want to be the first one to thank you. Everyone should check out helpscout.net. Mm-hmm.